This week on Bros, Bibles, and Beer. It becomes a descriptor to separate the ins versus the outs. And guess what? Anybody that thinks about God differently than me must be lukewarm because I feel like I'm on fire. It's giving to the poor, not the Creflo dollar. I know. He sounds like a shitty rapper. Oh, yeah. He just did an album with Aesop Rocky, right? I think those guys are pretty good. Uh, The person who comes to church and functions with the idea that someone else will take care of this, that I'm not needed to contribute to what this community needs to function. How is that for lukewarm? I'm not picking a side here. <laughs> it's like right there. Already lukewarm. I'm in trouble. I'm in hot water. I'm in hot lukewarm water. It seems as though it weaponizes a group to pay attention to the leader that's giving the group that statement to then get them to go along the vision and mission of the group they're a part of. And to me, that can be really dangerous. You're a stage four wizard, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> hey everybody, welcome to Bros, Bibles, and Beer. I am Andy McCraw, joined by Zach Crater. Hi, and sitting, Andy. <laughs> sitting in for Jeff Pearson is Colin Ferris. Yes. Oh my gosh, we are a podcast that has serious conversations about faith and culture without taking ourselves too seriously. So Spe- n- neither should you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Speaking <laughs> of not taking ourselves too seriously, I literally hit myself so hard in the head with those headphones. Uh, but the head and headphones. <laughs> well, you're doing a million things, uh, t- so people can know how the sausage is made tonight. We got a robot controlling the uh, everything. Yeah, so. yeah. Which is why it automatically switched away from you the moment you stop talking. Yep. And the moment that I start talking. So, regardless, uh, you're getting a, a glimpse behind the scenes, listener, of what it's like when you have an unfunded podcast, and that's what we are. Okay, Colin. Thanks for stepping in. You got the like the last minute call. It was amazing. I'm I'm glad I'm here. I know. I'm glad that you were able to clear the schedule. Yeah. And get Clarence. Yeah. Cheers, boys. Cheers. Okay. So uh, let's just dive into it on the YouTube comment section. If we if we dare to wade into those, we got a few. Uh, we got a few folks who chimed in on one of our episodes, and I believe it was two thirty five. With Courtney Lancaster? Correct. Former Bethel worship individual. (laughs) Thanks for not gendering her. Well, she wanted to be clear. She wasn't technically like a lead. She said, yeah, she was a singer. She was part of the, she she was on stage. She left before she got that label. Yes. So, regardless. So, a few of the comments, there was like a theme which was uh, calling us out as lukewarm. Hey, you're lukewarm, and the kind of the implication of the way that I read it was uh, either you're in or out. Because I think we had a pretty nuanced conversation about worship and those worship songs specifically. Hmm. And by the way, uh, podcast listener and viewer, if you are looking for a podcast where you get all the people in the room nodding in the same direction and agreeing on everything, like this is the wrong place. <laughs> You're not going to find it here. I agree with that 100%, Andy. <laughs> I do. Well, at least 90%. Anyway, um, so it it caused me to kind of uh, do a little bit of homework and dig into what the uh, what is really meant by the lukewarm 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 uh, comment there. So it is a it's a it's a reference to Revelation three sixteen, three sixteen, fifteen through sixteen. We are going to get biblical right away. All right, going straight into it. Wow, do it. So here it is. Uh, You're welcome, Cam. I know your works. You're neither hot nor sorry. You're neither cold nor hot. Uh, would that you were either cold or hot because so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold i will spit you out of my mouth okay so can i go back can i just read a couple of the quick comments oh you had them yeah i didn't know you even had them queued up yeah let's hear them roadrunner 86 their youtube name is like what is that i don't want to forget to mention luck warmers here <laughs> He also misspelled there, or the wrong... It, he spelled it right, but the wrong use of there, so... Who are you, even? Um, I'm a luck warmer. I, I got 5580. Lukewarmness. Call it out. Uh, Michelle Marcano. Oh, I know her. Do you Just, really? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm new here. So I, <laughs> I would have believed you. <laughs> oh, Michelle... Sorry, oh, oh. Michelle. I'm sorry if you're if you're watching. I didn't. Yeah. God is not the author of confusion. These people are creating tons of confusion. The fruit always reveals the root. Wow! Don't be deceived. God is holy. 
MMA Fighter, 1-1-1-1-8-8-9, lots of numbers. These songs and this podcast is garbage. Men and Women of God, pass us up. Uh, Mikey, Mikey John, this is a train wreck of a show. Pick a side. You are as lukewarm as they come, people. That's good. That's the one that I love the most. Well, loved is the wrong word, but that's the one that stuck out to me. <clears throat> because when I hear that, you, you guys tell me if you had a different interpretation. That comment right there, pick a side, you're as lukewarm as they come. So in that verse in Revelation 15 through 16, um, seems pretty clear. You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm in the middle. Um, what is the implications of picking a side and being hot or cold? What is implied, do you guys think? Like based on that passage or just in a general thought as to what that means? Let, like for this guy. What do we think he's saying? Or gal, Mikey, I'm guessing a guy. Um, picking a side, you're e- either in or out. I, I feel like most of culture right now is in either A or B, in or out. Good team, bad team, uh, red or blue. There's not a lot of room for nuance. And, you know, the biblical conversation is a little different, but I think for a lot of Christians, especially a lot of these, they didn't mention drinking. We got a lot of comments related to lukewarmness around drinking and language too. Like there's like, you can see beer and you can see the hard alcohol. They should be drunk on the spirit, not on spirits. And I say, why not both? I mean, yes, and. Uh, <laughs> but but there, it is it is like, for most of these Christians, it's like, they're not Christians like I am. And so right. they must be lukewarm. And they would probably describe it differently, but I think it becomes a, a descriptor to separate the ins versus the outs. And guess what? Anybody that thinks about God differently than me must be lukewarm because I feel like I'm on fire. I'm projecting on them a little bit. So would... Would hot? Would you associate, Colin? Would you associate hot with um, on on God's side, following the mission of God, and cold as against God? Do you think that's what's being implied with this? Hey, you're either one or the other. Make up your mind. With the the commenters' comments, would they say hot is right and cold is dead and wrong? I I I don't know. It seems like it based on their tone. Pick a side. Yeah. But what's behind the question, Andy? Where are we getting there? Where are we going? Are you setting a trap for our guest? (sighs) I'm setting a trap. No, I'm not setting a trap for for the guest, but here's here's what I uh, dug into. So there's a couple of links. We'll put them in the show notes. Um, I tried to kind of pick around from a few different very, uh, like, uh, uh, different types of views on this area and what's interesting is that most of them are pretty like pretty similar in how they're interpreting this section so this is right down the middle christianity.com so in this context being hot refers to having a passionate and committed faith while being cold could mean rejecting faith altogether lukewarm christian therefore is someone whose commitment to their faith is tepid or half-hearted it's often used to encourage believers to be more dedicated and sincere in their relationship with God. I feel like that's the definition. This is referring to the Revelation passage. Yeah, I feel like, and and most applications of the term lukewarm and the hot and the cold. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's what I grew up uh, thinking about that that verse, or when someone would use that term lukewarm, or and the hot and cold in in relation to hot and cold, it was hot. You're you're a person of faith. Cold, you're out. And and God saying, at least you made up your mind. <laughs> yeah, I was I was always worried because my personality is if I don't know you, it's reserved. And so the idea of like, oh, you're a Christian, you better be out there sharing your faith. Like that that was terrifying to me, and never something I was gonna do. Like I will have a conversation and get to know somebody in in private, but going out there and evangelizing street preacher style. Like that's growing up. I, that was my understanding is like, those are the on fire Christians. And if you're not doing that, it, you might, it's not necessarily wrong, but you might be in trouble. And so I even have a little bit of PTSD thing, not, not legitly, but just thinking back on the fact that I can't, I'm not the street preacher guy and I never will be. Well, there's going to be a test 
uh, shortly, and we'll be able to figure <laughs> out which one of us are and to what degree we are hot. Perfect. Or well, I failed the biblical warm. worldview test, and technically you did too, Andy. Uh, Jeff was the only one that passed according to the test we took. Oh, that's right. Okay, so here's what got really interesting to me. So I used to think that the hot and cold meant in or out, and that God just wanted you to make up your mind whether or not you were in or out when it came to believing, accepting, and following Him. Uh, but instead. The, the historical context describes, this is a letter to Laodicea, the church at Laodicea. Um, there were two cities in, uh, in close relation to it, and I'll tell you what they were. By the way, yeah, to the church in Laodicea, we're, we're unpacking somebody else's mail. That does not mean there's not stuff for us to, to glean from yeah. and apply to our lives. But I think most Christians read the Bible, especially Revelation, as like, no, this is our this is future telling for us. And I think a, a more accurate thing is like you're reading somebody else's mail, and there are things that will apply to us, and yeah. there are universal truths. But this isn't something. This isn't hey to the church in Mission Viejo to the church of San Juan Capistrano, whatever. So it may be less prescriptive than it's people just a think. little bit of context. It just it just colors it a little bit. It doesn't. I'm not throwing it out. Now, Colin's <laughs> an actual wizard, so he can tell no. you whether or not that is true or not. Oh, you want to give just real quick? What are, What are your credentials? You're stage four. <laughs> you're a stage four wizard, right? <laughs> what people watching this are like? What are you talking about? Well, Should explain. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Back in 2012, I graduated with a Master of Divinity. That's where the wizard comes from. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. <laughs> From Fuller Theological Seminary, which I'm sure some people will say that's super liberal, too far outside the box, etc. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. Well, you can feel free to correct us in our doctrinal uh, faux pas, and so you can beat the uh, commenters to the punch because they would like to correct us. Okay. All right. Here we go. So, ancient history has uh, revealed that the city of Laodicea was known for its tepid, lukewarm water supply. Nearby, two ancient cities of Heropolis and Colossae, both of those cities had well-deserved reputations for their water supplies. Heropolis boasted of hot springs that contained therapeutic, medicinal, and hot mineral water. Colossae enjoyed uh, cold and refreshing mountain spring water. The water in Laodicea, on the other hand, reportedly dirty and lukewarm. So, when this... Analogy is given, um, and John John wrote Revelation, right? Uh, John of Patmos, which is different different than the author of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> so, so using this analogy is especially helpful to this this group of people in Laodicea because they have a clear understanding. Mm-hmm. Hot and cold water are both seen as very positive things. Cool, refreshing water, um, hot, medicinal, therapeutic water as well. The negative one is the lukewarm piece, and and so that's an important distinction to make. So it's less about the in and out. Don't hang out in the middle. It's like the the extremities are the positives. Sitting in the middle is what's seen as the negative. Um. Okay, so so basically they ended by saying, therefore, this passage is saying that it's much better for Christians to be either fervent, hot, or refreshing, cold, rather than to be lukewarm. Something that no one in Laodicea Laodicea wanted, and apparently Laodicea had some cool aqueducts too that would it would bring in the idea of bringing let's get that goodness from the other one, get that goodness from up over there. But by the time it, it got there, it was yeah ne- neither hot nor cold, and it, Laodicea was a pretty wealthy area, I believe. Yep. So skipping ahead, uh, JD Greer went to his website. And we're going to get into the test that he borrows from Francis Chan. But um, just real quickly, here's what he's saying. He just reiterates on that, that the uh, the idea is Jesus is criticizing the church for being full of believers who were neither hot nor cold, not cold. Sorry, they were neither hot nor cold. So they were not cold, dead, or unbelieving, but they weren't on fire for Jesus either. He basically said, I like hot coffee and cold brew, but if it's room temperature, I want to spit it out of my mouth. That's a direct translation. I like that paraphrase. <laughs> it just makes it so applicable to our lives. Right. Starbucks Christianity. Okay. So, are you guys ready 
they uh, they gave nine different uh, descriptions uh, in Francis Chan's uh, book Crazy Love. I'm gonna hate them all. Let's go. <laughs> He gives these. Now, I'll go one by one, and we can each uh, decide how if how we feel about them. If we agree, if we disagree, and if we think that we maybe represent that. And these descriptions are of lukewarm According to Francis Chan, what it means to be a lukewarm Christian. He'll give the profile of, of what it means to be a, yeah, a lukewarm Christian, like you literally just said. Okay. Here we go. Lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. God is a useful fire escape they employ, not a God they worship. Wow. Yes and no. Now, again, I reserve the right to change. So how is that for lukewarm? I'm not picking a side here. (laughs) It's like right there. Already lukewarm. I'm in trouble. I'm in hot water. I'm in hot, lukewarm water. Um, You wish you were in hot water. Unfortunately, you're not. Oh, man. The fire escape thing gets me a little bit because for maybe for Francis, but for most Christians that believe that they need to convert people so that they don't go to hell and they go to heaven, that is the the main goal of making disciples when Jesus says to go into all the world. That's how they interpret that. And so an on-fire Christian in that context would be somebody that's literally like you're you're providing fire insurance like your evangelism is based on fear and so it that's not exactly what francis chan is saying but the average evangelical christian how are they not providing fire insurance and that's rhetorical and if you guys it, it's also a volleyball if you well, want to spike it or whatever what do you think it means when he says uh, to be saved from the penalty of the sin, not from the sin? That that's the goal is to be saved from the penalty of sin, not to be saved from sin. So keep on sinning, and then when you die, at least you won't go to hell. Yeah, that's my fire escape. I that's, don't have to change anything. Yeah, or I don't have to change everything. Oh, do I need to change everything? I guess it depends. Yeah, what do you need to change, Andy? I mean, well, well I mean, we have these taboo sins in culture where yeah. it's easy to point fingers at. And then you have... It's weird. None of them are pride and self-righteousness, but continue. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and And so then... In the finger pointing, it's also a lot easier to build unity in the act of finger pointing by saying, hey, we're not this. Yeah. And I don't want to be derailed in my point, so I'm trying to get back to what my point was. But in terms of having to change everything, and I'm kind of thinking about process versus coming to Jesus and having a radical, like everything's changed now that I've met Jesus. And in some way, it seems to be God's prerogative in in terms of how people meet God. Yeah. And to say the Apostle Paul's conversion is the template now and always for how things should be and leave no room for process or to pick you know, to pick the taboo sin as the first thing that one needs to be repentant of versus considering the possibility that it might be okay with God if that one was given a longer leash, Mm. but there may be something else more insidious that once that's dealt with, that more taboo thing goes bye-bye. Yeah. But that, based on our finiteness, we're not able to discern necessarily what that is it's just a heck of a lot easier to say you're still in sin look at the taboo (laughs) and then proceed with the in and out language right because we're confined to this particular slice of time when we're viewing the other person and we're diagnosing that moment in time without giving any thought to the underwater goings on that are going on between them and the lord yeah so that's i've deviated obviously, from the main question. Yeah, but. well, I always have a knee-jerk reaction to the statement that Jesus changes everything because I don't 
I actually don't think he does that. It implies that there's nothing uh, worth the nothing of you that remains um, once Jesus comes along. Hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is he created me though. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things. The core of my personality will stay true. Um, And am I? I could be a generous person before and. Would Jesus change that <laughs> if if I came to faith in him? Mm-hmm. No, like yeah, it might just change the lens with which you look through to be generous. Sure, that might change. Uh, am I suddenly healed of my afflictions when I accept Jesus? No, Jesus doesn't change anything. Everything, and I don't think he promises. <laughs> he does it. change. He does change things. He doesn't change everything. (laughs) Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, All right, we're on to number two. By the way, we didn't score ourselves on that. How would you guys? Do you guys feel like... uh, I think I won. Do you you want... That's what we're doing, right? Do you want to be saved from your sin? uh, Or Sorry, do you only want to be saved from the penalty of your sin, not of your sin? And is God your useful fire escape, not a God you worship? Oh man, there's it's it's so loaded because <laughs> what is what does it mean to worship God? It's a yes or no question. So no and no, it's okay. I, I don't view it as a fire escape. I I believe that I'm truly and unconditionally loved by God, and um, sometimes I forget what that means, and it can allow me to drift off into sin and whatnot. But like knowing I, when I do make a mistake, I know about it, and because I tell you. <laughs> yeah, because because Andy, Andy tells me, but also that you know when you mess up, like you say something and you just you think about, oh my gosh, I I just I yeah. might have just wounded, like nothing major, but I might have just said something in a way that hurt my kid. Yeah. Um, and you, you just adjust and move on. What is gone is the oh my god shame. Am I not saved? Let me ask Jesus in my heart again tonight. Which was a that's different. We haven't gone to that one yet. But that was a rinse and repeat, yeah. but it's related to the fire insurance a little bit. This that's, one is, that's this, gone for me. I don't have fire insurance. I don't think Co- I need it. Colin, does this describe you? I don't. I don't think it does. I don't think it does either. No, <laughs> no. I don't think any of us are flippant with grace. It's because yeah. Fuller just tainted you. <laughs> Fuller theological <laughs> seminary. All right, number two. Let's see how we feel about this one. Lukewarm Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ. Yet they do not do radical things themselves. Oh, Francis, what is radical? I hate the word radical here. They call they call radical what Jesus expects of all his followers. Yeah, you know what okay. is radical? Uh, okay, be perfect like your Father in heaven's perfect. Love your enemies. In- 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 oh, I wish I had the soundboard. Love, see anemones. <laughs> Love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. Do good to those who spite you. I'm mashing up a few verses, but it be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, and that's because w- that's what He does, and that's what He expects of you. That is radical now more than ever because we're so divided, and like you can't be a Christian and vote Democrat. I see people online that are Christians more on the left side that are just like, if you vote for Trump, you're just like way off base because of X, Y, and Z. What about go forth and make disciples of all the nations? Um, what does it mean to be a disciple then? It, that is not, I think, what most people think of is, and you can correct me, <clears throat> wizard, <clears throat> is convert, convert, go and make converts. That's how most Christians look at that. That's not what it says. Yeah. Make disciples. But, and also, I've heard a better translation of that is wherever you go in the world, make, it's not a call to like cover the earth and make converts. It's like wherever you're at, look to make disciples. Mm-hmm. Dave's translation? People is that the one? Very yeah. convenient. Hey, yeah. where, wherever you go, there you are. Hey, man. <laughs> you want to like follow Jesus with me or something? Colin, what do you think? And you can rebuke me. Read it. I'm not, there's nothing to read right re- now. You want me to read no. it again? Yeah, please. So, lukewarm Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, uh-huh. yet they do not do radical things themselves. They call radical what Jesus Jesus expects of all his followers. Those are the things they're, they're calling. Yeah, I... It's. I'd like to know where in 
Francis's book, he put that line because that would give me more context to know, not necessarily how to attack it. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of, that is a bit of a knee jerk reaction because it's the statement. It, it seems as though it weaponizes a group to pay attention to the leader that's giving the group that statement Ooh. to then get them to go along the way or the vision and mission of the group they're a part of. And to me, that's, that can be really dangerous because the definition of radical and what just Jesus expected disciples to do, if people aren't reading the text, and even if they are with so many potential interpretations, there is room Dave's for... Tr- Dave's interpretation. Yeah, Dave's right. Over, but there's, uh, there's room for... Uh, there's more opportunity for disagreement and division than I think unity. And yeah, yeah. so I'm th- that statement is really concerning because I don't know where it comes from in the text of his book, where he said it. Sure. And so it's difficult for me to say, oh yeah. Well, this podcast is like, I thought that was good. 85% speculation. So okay. whatever you say, technically will be, be okay. It's, ex- it's acceptable. And because it's, I'm except, speaking from a place of ignorance. <laughs> these are just, a, too, yeah. I, I hate it when it's like, well, you, it's like, these are yeah. opinions. Yeah. It's going to be okay. We can change them if we need to. Wander like, around yeah. with us today, listener yeah. and YouTube watcher. What came to mind for me immediately when I read this was, I imagined the person who after Sunday service, walks out and goes, man, that was awesome. They had someone who's building wells in Nicaragua Mm. and and sharing God's love with people. How cool is that? And that's the extent of their reaction. That's the extent of what happens with them. Nothing nothing changes in their lives. They they don't do anything differently. And so, it, the description of they're moved by that. that oh wow, what, that is wonderful, amazing. Mm-hmm. I'll do nothing that comes near near that. I won't even attempt to do that. It was enough for me to be moved by somebody else's actions. I think that's how I imagine. Like that's the that's the story that the movie that plays in my head when I read that. Could be. Yeah. No, it's the movie that's in no. my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> for reals shut uh, up Colin you're not in my brain wizard <laughs> not yet okay let's go he, to number three he's just gathering yeah. data on both of us <laughs> oh my gosh this is not the Francis Chan you're looking yeah. for <laughs> alright number three lukewarm Christians equate their partially sanitized lives with holiness oh man but Jesus didn't call us to sanitation. He calls us to discipleship. If you are his follower, you'll, your life will not be defined only by avoiding sin, but also entering into his suffering. This one is loaded. There's like 17 things in this one. Can we first talk about what, what is, let's give our own definitions of what is meant by sanitized lives. I think it's a lot of the, a lot of the comments we're getting, they, against cussing and drinking, are a lot of those people, and this is my guess, but I've seen it in way too many Christians in my own life. They say the right things. They look the part in public. They they don't have a drink in public. Yeah. If they're at home, they'll drink. They might use different language. Um, and they might act differently. The, the church face is the word that comes to mind. Um, sure. Sure. You go to church and like you, you're pulling up, screaming at each other with your spouse, and the kids are crying. And you get out and you walk up to church like, "Hey, everybody!" <laughs> um, a version of that, yeah. Or the the uh, <clears throat> the general belief that I'm a good person, I don't do anything terrible, and by me being a good person, uh, my life is sanitized. Um, that gets in my mind is equated with holiness. I have never once stripped. Wow! For money, congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good. Uh, like that, right? No. Uh, well, maybe it's it's. 
You think of all the evil sins in your mind, like the, the yeah. big ones. I don't do the bad things. Yeah. That's the not really the movie bad. in Andy's I don't, I don't mind do, right now. Yeah. Though. Now I've got a different movie in my <laughs> mind. Thanks a lot. Caddyshack? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I don't do those really bad things. Yeah. That equals holiness. But I don't think that equals holiness. Yeah. And I, I, I generally would agree with this statement by Francis Chan in, in general. And what it means to be to to say suffer like Christ, to co suffer with Christ. Yeah, yeah. He said basically, it's um, your life. Your life should not be defined by only avoiding sin, but uh, also by entering into His suffering. And what what do you think he means by that? Yeah, what's what's the fuller. Uh, seminary description of entering into Jesus's suffering, sharing in his suffering. You want me to come back, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, it just depends on the comments we get on your yeah, appearance. Okay, so we'll yeah, see. okay. Fuller, this is definitely, barely even knower. <laughs> yeah, not a succinct answer by any means, but I think I already have a problem with a first world evangelical wide skin definition of what suffering would be from the get-go. So to talk about. We're, we're getting know. some pretty negative comments. So that doesn't count as suffering. <laughs> no, I don't think that counts as suffering at I all. I, yeah. But the, de- well, definitely not. Can, can you abstract it and like, yeah, let's just talk about what, uh, Jesus suffering. Like what is, what yeah, does that I'm, look like? Um, I think maybe in the most mundane, and this is where I'm verbally processing here. Yeah. But welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Now I'm finally it's, here. You're doing it. I'm here. <laughs> you're doing I'm it. I'm flying. <laughs> so I think the more mundane I can talk about receiving something that could be potentially an offense, but not giving it energy and power and whether it's turning the other cheek or whatever. And for being just an idiot, that doesn't count. But for... Yeah, make up an for, example. Um, uh, we drive in Orange County, so I think that this should be there should be a pretty good example here. But you're driving along the street and... Oh, pulling out of Costco. A uh, person... No, I wasn't pulling out of Costco, but I was pulling out of some place where they were two lanes away and they changed lanes in the intersection, got behind me and then be- proceeded to flashlights. And my thought was, shouldn't be changing lanes in an intersection because you're not supposed to. So, but could I have gotten offended and rolled down the window and screamed and yelled at them and Follow them into the Costco parking lot. Yeah, it would have been an option. It would have been silly. I've seen that happen. Yeah, I watched yeah, that. I watched that on uh, Beef on Netflix. But I, I don't like that example. Is so dumb to me because when I, I'm comparing that to crucifixion yeah. or to Christ sufferings and escaping crowds, that feels so gross. And like having that, but forced to give an, a lame example of what I mean by. Maybe that's the mundane thing. What I'm going to stick with it because I think if I did take offense to that and I did allow that to really get under my skin, who knows sure. how I would have maybe not been present for the kids that needed me when I got home yeah, or when a client called. And because I'm now giving energy to anger and not pursuing peace, I'm not there. I'm unable to hear that more creative problem solving, gracious, merciful side of the brain is just kind of starting yeah. to shut down and more that you bruise my ego, vengeance, anger side is, you know, is it play? Yeah. Yes. Setting aside retribution, even if you were done wrong. Yeah. Like that's, and, and we have some version of that in, in all of our spaces. Like you were saying before, none of us are encountering crucifixion. Right. So, what is the version of, what does it mean for us to enter into Christ's suffering? Yeah, that's like the, it's not, I wouldn't totally discount that or moments like that. It, if, 
if the max is father forgive them they don't know what they're doing because literally i'm the sinless guy and they're putting me to death right now for in front of everybody that is like the ultimate suffering unjustly but like you said being wronged even though you didn't do do anything wrong yeah like a version of that these are these are little ways and yeah they, they are very little the scale of one to ten where we got 10 plus at Jesus on the cross and like we're at we're back in the decimals under one with some of these these things mm -hmm. it's still a version of it so when I hear him talking about the suf co-suffering with Christ it's just no greater love than this than one laying down their, their lives for their brothers or people you love right. and then even more so when the call to radical enemy love like laying your, down your lives for people you hate like anybody could could do good to those that they love. Yeah, that's not hard. But the co-suffering of Christ is like where the rubber, rubber meets the road is like doing good when it hurts the most. Like that kind of love is the hardest thing. So that I would be on board with using radical language. I, When a, a lot of preachers are talking about being radical, it just sounds like is, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Is Sean Fucht? Foyt? Foyt. Foyt. Sean Foyt. Sean Foyt. Is he radical because he's on his crusade? Uh, maybe that's the wrong word, but he's like traveling the country. He's like basically like a political operative, but he's counter protesting in the name of Jesus. Hmm. Um, for, for, right now it's for Israel, but right before this, it was basically to vote red. Um, and don't get triggered by that. I'm not going there, but he views, he's like, he's going for it. And he might interpret it as like, this is me co-suffering with Christ because he's experiencing pushback. And you, you get other people that, that like, if they act like a jackass online, but they're doing it because they're Christian. Yeah. And then they say, well, they're doing it. They're against me because I love Jesus. Like, or maybe you're just being an asshole. Like, where's the difference there? And that's not what I, so when I hear people use radical, oftentimes yeah. it means doing stuff like that. That's like, oh, I would never do that. And it feels gross to do it. I, as you guys were describing that, it made me think of courtroom situations. Uh, two in particular, like we've seen parents of... I love Judge Judy. <laughs> <laughs> we've seen parents of kids who were murdered and them forgive the murderer in the courtroom. Oh, God, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought of that. And then the, the other one that I thought of was... Uh, a crazy concept. What if Christians just made the decision to never enter into lawsuits, like never to be the plaintiff in lawsuits? What if they chose to do that? It would, it would radically change the world. That's, and it would involve deep suffering. I'm not suggesting that's a great thing to do. I'm just posing this as like a crazy idea. I think mm -hmm. you can provide you can find biblical justification for the idea of like, don't sue your brother. And I think it was old Testament, but yeah. so it wouldn't like, Oh, are, now we have the new litmus test. Are you, are you Christian? Cause if you're not, I can, <laughs> I can sue you for this, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But there is like, there's some, there is a biblical basis for it. I think basically it's like, Hey, just, just work it out. Just fix it. You don't yeah. need to like get, make it a big deal. Um, but that, could, that you're going beyond that for yeah. sure. And that would be pretty radical. I, th I don't think any of us would check this box of lukewarmness. I don't think we look for partially sanitized lives to be conflated with holiness. You keep your mouth off of my box checking. I'll talk to myself. Number four. <laughs> Lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith with their neighbors, coworkers, or friends. Like Charles Spurgeon said, you are either a missionary or an imposter. Charles Spurgeon was gnarly. Should we define what it means to share your faith with your neighbors? Maybe we should describe what that, that looks like because well, I bet people my, have some very specific ideas in their mind of what that means. I guarantee yeah. you my definition would be different than... Can you imagine doing everything and doing anything and every time you did something, you would have to make sure they knew you did it because of Jesus? That's not what he's saying. I think that's what a lot of Christians think. Oh, that's... Well, 
according to share your faith. Yeah. It doesn't say do it every single time, everywhere, all, all the time. But lukewarm Christians rarely share their oh, faith. Oh, he left an out. Okay. With their neighbors, coworkers, or friends. They rarely do it. What about, so he didn't say never, so I'm safe. He said, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's why I was like, okay, so what does that mean to share? What does share your faith mean? What does that look like? If I just handed you the four spiritual laws and-, and Enjoy walk- this. Enjoy this light reading for the next time you poop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I walked away. Did or I, when you're out of toilet paper. Yeah. Or <laughs> Whoa. Hey, oh. did I check the box? Did I, did I share my faith with my neighbor? I'm not coworker? saying that's what it is. And yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's sharing it's, your faith in any Mennonite sort of way. No. Cause it's, it's the, um, what is the Mennonite? Yeah. Way? Cause if like, any of these questions, I could check all the boxes I want. Sure. But it's- That's what, why it's fun. What did my kids say? Yeah. What does my wife say? What did my co- coworkers say? What did my neighbors say? And, you know- Well, your wife says what, what is, you what tell is, her to say, right? <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. No. You are sitting in for Jeff. <laughs> I'm sitting in the wrong spot. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so it would be, you know, what would Tim or Bill, those we are you, neighbors Jeff. on either side of us, yeah. say about- the Ferris family in particular, and do we hear Colin yelling at his kids or what, what's going on over there, right? Yeah. And so sharing of faith, it's got to be, it's, I think it can be diluted into that one conversation or that, that handing of a tract. And I'm not going to say that handing someone a tract isn't going to work yeah, because it does. And and the the reality that people have come to know Jesus through Benny Hinn, which is many people love to hate, and I'm not going to get into that. But every once in a while, a fan hits a half court shot at halftime and wins <laughs> themselves a Cadillac and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, we're talking about a broken clock here. Yeah, twice a day. I don't. I don't disagree with you though. Yeah, I. And so it's more about less propositional, less positioning questions in my mind and more living a life that's open, permeable enough so that yeah. people that I'm in close proximity to, it's going to come out, but it's not something I have to get super anxious about and I need to lead with right away. Yeah. Because my, I'm not, at least in my particular uh, way of following Jesus, I'm not like looking for divine appointments. I'm, I'm more looking for a long-term relationship with people. And if people are open to it, then cool. And then we'll see what happens. What I, does divine appointment mean in this context for you? Yeah, a, like a divine appointment of, here I am, I've just met this person. I'm sitting next to them on a plane. I'm never going to see them again. Yeah. Now's my opportunity. They might go to hell if you don't say something. So I need to start start a conversation with them. Yeah. And and based on the questions I ask, I get them to start thinking about spiritual things. Yeah. Eternal things. Yeah. And then the conversation unfolds by seemingly benign questions that chance are in en- fact chance encounters versus the neighbors that you live next door right. to and see every day. Yeah. Yeah. I've been on the other end of those where Which ones? Of what you described, like somebody basically like, oh, we're talking for the first time and let me share my faith with you Hmm. in my direction. You look like you're not a Christian. You act like it too. Yep. I was where I had a shirt on that said, I'm not a Christian. Definitely. Um, Don't even ask. But you, one, I'm well versed with the other side of that coin, but I, I think most people can pick up when it's not real. Yeah. And not that you don't believe it, not that you don't care. Like the the subject, the person that you're talking about that, oh my gosh, I need to say something. Yeah. If I don't say something, I'm a bad Christian. I am not hmm. hot. I might be lukewarm if I don't say something. By the way, I th- I'm, hot, I'm pretty hot, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> or you're icy cold and you're refreshing. People pick up on it in a way that's like, it's a little gross because it, I don't know you. We... We have zero trust between us. It's, you know, I like 
the let's see where it goes. Let's earn earn the trust, get to know somebody. When they trust you and they see the way you actually live your life, the fruit of your faith, as it were, it it will lead to more opportunities to just to talk to them in a way that's like it's very human. Sure. And it's but if if you do have the motif of like behind everything is like Oh my gosh, if they got in a car accident after this and I didn't say anything, it's kind of on me. Did you just say motive with an accent? Motif? Motif. <laughs> Maybe. Uh-oh. It's French. Oh, no. <laughs> That's my fault. Keep going. Oh, that is hilarious. <laughs> we didn't check that box. That's funny. We're still going. But anyways, um, I can take this. Do you have anything more to say on that, Colin? Okay, when, now that you're coming back. All right, I'm back, I'm back. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Listeners, and if you're a viewer, you would have seen this. There was, uh, we forgot to put one of our cameras on airplane mode. Yep. Mama was calling. And Mama was calling. And if you're like, wait, why are you using phones instead of real cameras? It's because we're poor. Because we're poor, and we would like you to send us some money. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll edit that out. So, I've... I'm anxious anytime I ever share anything about um, my faith with someone who I've not done that with before, and I'm not sure where they stand. Mm. Actually, even if I know where they stand, even if I know that they're another Christian, like a coworker, even even then, I like I feel anxious. Oh, you know they're a Christian, and you they don't necessarily know you are, and so in effect, you have to come out of the closet as a Christian to them as a yeah, Christian. Yeah, that, that happens. Um, there is, however, what's been really refreshing is, uh, there's a friend of mine at work who's Muslim and he and I have the most open, Hmm. awesome conversations and I look forward to it every single time. And I I think he does too. It, and for some reason it feels so different. There is no inhibitions and I get to like just say the things that I think and care about that <laughs> usually I would feel would be like reserved for these types of conversations with people that I've known deeply for years and trust and, you know, it feels like these are safe kind of places. But I also agree with you guys that like, it's not about, did I just check the box and hand something over to you? But like, is what I believe, does it reflect in the way that I live? Uh, does it reflect in how I treat other people? Hopefully it does, how I treat my family, how I treat the others and, and how that's viewed. And and do I think that my neighbors know what I, hmm. in general, what I believe? Oh, man, if they really knew what I believed. <laughs> 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 but if I, if I think that they know in general what I believe and that it seems to align with my actions, like I feel like that is a way for me to share my faith. Yeah. Some would call that a total cop-out, though, because I didn't go up and try to convert them. Yeah, but I think for the other side of that coin... still time. (laughs) Yeah, we can change you. (laughs) Well, that's the (laughs) argument of urgency, right? Okay, let's keep going. Is that okay? Um, Can I do a little dip our toe into the context of Laodicea real quick? Yeah. As a little... uh, More? Accoutrement. Tell me more about their water. How much did they charge per month? Because we look at that passage and we want to bring it into our context... But in the context there, this is from a blog post, Pistios Daily. What does Pistios mean, Colin? Pisteo. Okay, thank it's, you. Uh, it means, I believe, or this has been a while since I've done Greek. It's, Pistis is faith, right? Pistis, yeah. So, so I think it's Spanish for pistachios. Scroll up again. This way? Yeah, please. Yeah, I don't remember the Greek conjugation. Sorry. <laughs> what you knew the word conjugation that's good enough for me <laughs> <laughs> all right um so going back to that passage in revelation where it's it's like to the church of laodicea you're neither hot nor cold I'll spit you out of my mouth whatnot it was a wealthy wealthy time wealthy place laodicea so from this blog post and i, I will put this in the show notes um Oh, they were rich. They weren't. They weren't hurting. They didn't need for much, yeah. right? Yeah, and it, so when Jesus says, "Because you say 
I am rich and have acquired great wealth and need nothing. That's chapter 317. He lets them know that the grand claim and accompanying attitude of the city of Laodicea following the earthquake that leveled their city, which I don't think you get from the Bible. Like, this is all like historical context. Uh, yeah. Um, so like, yeah, we don't need help or funds from Rome to rebuild. And that infiltrated the church. This is what lets us know that there were very likely some wealthy individuals to be found in the church. Yeah. Perhaps they were preaching a very early version of the prosperity gospel. Again, this is not a problem unless the presence of the wealth leads to ungainly results, such as we can see in the letter James, in which the wealthy are treated better simply within the church and afforded greater honor in the honor and shame culture, simply because of the fact of their wealth. Lest they become too puffed up with their wealth, which would have been gained through their well-known business of money exchange for the region, which is 13 or 318A, uh, their sale of high-end clothing made from black wool, for which Laodicea was famous, or the sale of the renowned eye salve. So in that in that section, it mentions like put hey, put on this eye salve, put on white clothes. It doesn't give us the like they were known for their rich, dark clothing. So it's almost I like I feel like I'm one of their customers. I could use both their eye salve and oh my I like gosh. me a good black shirt. Oh my gosh, yeah, we do. <laughs> I know. Well, today's I'm out of <laughs> yeah. I'm out of uniform. <laughs> Cuz it goes on to say um buy for me white clothing so that you be, can be clothes and your shink I think it's a misspelling clothed and your shameful nakedness will not be exposed by eye salve and put on your eyes so you can see. So it's really this context of wealth. And I think you can make an argument of the hospitality angle that is prevalent throughout all of scripture of like, how did you treat people that had less than you? Yeah. And so we want to make it into like, are you a good Christian or not? Are you telling people on G- about Jesus because you're on fire? Um, but there's a real argument, like a lot of the communion, like when Paul is critiquing some of the communion practices is because the, the drunk, the rich people were getting drunk and eating all the food and leaving nothing for the poor people. But the idea is like, you're leaving people out of the sacraments, you're out of the communion table. And please correct me uh, if, if I'm off base, there's a real motif that is uncomfortable for Western Christianity because we are so wealthy and it has turned into fire insurance where the way of Jesus is like hospitality driven. The sins of Sodom were, according to the Old Testament, were hospitality. You weren't taking care of the poor, um, that sort of thing. And I think that's in this passage too. So the church in Laodicea, you had a lot of stuff. And were you just doing that stuff for the people that were like you? And you were were you ignoring the people that didn't have or just have? For, Or only for yourself. I think the yeah. Jesus uh, parable of the talents also gets referenced here and that like how the, the master is angry at the guy, the servant that he gave the money to who just buried it and did nothing and, yeah. he, re- and he returned it. And he's like, that's, that wasn't the point. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't point. The point wasn't just to hold on to it. Right. Right. And so, yeah, I think the two things that came to mind for me were, are if, if you if you are financially well off, are you a generous person? And does it make you think that you don't need for much? That you don't, ultimately, that you don't need God? And I think both of those things are probably the hardest struggles for financially well off people. Yeah, Jesus telling, hey, I, I did everything. What do I need to do? What else do I need to do? He tells the rich man, sell all you have and give to the poor. And the guy's like, oh, anything else? All right. Yeah, keep going. Keep going? Okay. Next one. All right, here we go. Uh, Number five, lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. I disagree with that. I, I, this is my first one. I'm like, yeah. All right. I disagree with that. Say more. No. Because I'd like to propose uh, whether you're refreshingly cold or pleasingly hot you have great concern for what's going on in the world yeah and it's and like tangible are people starving are people lonely are people naked that type of stuff yeah um 
and that you're moved to act on behalf of those individuals that, and even for, for people that don't have voices for themselves. So whether it's the person that doesn't speak the language of the place that are, you know, fresh from somewhere else or the, the kid that their la- language acquisition isn't up, isn't up to snuff yet. And so they can't even yeah. say what's going on and they need an intercessor or an, or an advocate. And so to, I think sometimes that, and I don't, I don't think this is what Francis was suggesting. So I may be. The implication there is that I don't, what, ma- what happens on earth doesn't matter. And that yeah, it feels weird, right? It, it yeah, and I, so maybe I'm not treating it fairly, but I think being so otherworldly minded that they're no earthly good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's like, uh, nice I'll pray for sticking. you and awesome. I just needed a hug. <laughs> yeah. W- one so, of the things when Kanye wet one of his beefs that we read last, last episode about thoughts and prayers are enough. Thoughts and prayers aren't going to bring Black Wall Street back. You know, that thoughts and prayers aren't going to bring the suffering back or aren't going to change the suffering. It, it takes doing. Yeah. We didn't unpack that totally. We were just more reacting to other things, but that's something I totally agree with. It's like doing yeah. the whole, I'll pray for you. It's it's like, no, what what can you actually do? If you, maybe you can't do anything directly. Right. In that case, I will receive and accept prayers. But if I'm in trouble for whatever reason and you can do something about me and you care about me, like, you Thoughts should try. Of, yeah. <laughs> you should at least try. Yeah. And so like, it, and that's real world. That's not eternally focused. Also, you just look at Jesus' ministry in life. It's very much about then and there and like what is happening now, what he's critiquing with things. And we will often, I think, sometimes for good reasons, but when you emphasize only the afterlife, mm-hmm. Jesus wasn't primarily doing that in my understanding it was it was more he it was human getting your feet dirty doing things and we will often put that back and ascribe afterlife things to it like when he says my kingdom is not not of this world we just assume heaven and not hell what's he, a charitable interpretation of this read it again lukewarm Please. christians think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven so so before Colin answers this and gives us the right answer, when you said what's a charitable interpretation of this, like you're such a better Christian than me because I'm I'm just like I'm like this is, this is terrible. Burn that question. Is there a ver- I'm just trying to figure out is there a version of this that I'm not a better Christian. I might be a slightly better podcaster in this moment. <laughs> That's it. Hmm. But is. I think it comes down. So many of these is like, what do you mean by? What do you mean by insert whatever the term is or the concept? And so, what do you, what do you think is 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 the author trying to say here? What's Fan- Francis Chan trying to say here? I'll give it one more time because I just said a bunch of words and maybe I'll, I'll keep it fresh in your mind. Lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more than eternity in heaven. Hmm. The bit we're going again. I'm thinking of critiques. We're going for the goodness. Yeah, yeah. We're, a charitable interpretation. Like in in general, I I usually find myself liking the things that Francis Chan says. I don't tend to disagree with him too heavily. And so, I, if we define Earth as world, in those those worldly things that Paul would talk about, yeah, then. Okay, that's a charitable interpretation because I'm I'm not looking at I'm not thinking of Earth as hey let's bring wholeness yeah um, like from an ecological perspective as well as a relational standpoint human to human as well as human to divine human to Jesus but when I use Paul's worldly and he, and he goes on these diatribes describing what that is. Yeah. Uh, then, okay, um, that would fit. That's a more charitable interpretation. I think about what the Bible has to say about anxiety and, you know, don't worry about 
tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And I think that there, there's a, in my mind, there's a connection there between like, I'm just, oh my gosh, how am I going to take care of blah, this thing that's going to happen right now? And, and I'm myopically focused on the thing that's right in front of me. And, mm-hmm. I, and it's easy to get stuck into that mode, right? I think we do that all the time. Yeah. And maybe that's, in my mind, the most charitable interpretation of this is like, is that where you're living? Are you living like two feet in front of your face? And you're missing all of this other stuff. And maybe it is, are you are you not thinking about the implications of uh, taking your neighbor to court and what that means ultimately beyond they owe you $10,000? But that's not a secret that I'm <laughs> releasing, by the way. I have no neighbors that owe me any money. I'm not trying to sue anybody. <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> Small claims, <laughs> ten thousand or less. Oddly specific, Andy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Maybe your neighbor Garrett would you seven thousand four hundred twenty-two dollars <laughs> because his dog bit your dog. No, you know what I mean, though. I I do. I'm trying to. I'm going to try to do a charitable interpretation. Um, I think you can. One ways. One of the ways of like the the new heaven and new earth is better understood, I think, as a renewed heaven and earth, which can imply a process. I think a lot of Christians, and myself included for a large portion of my life, it's like, well, eventually God's going to make it right, and it's going to be a new heaven, new earth, and at some point there's going to be a switch flip yeah. of some sort, as opposed to if the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and it expands and grows— maybe that's a part of how the earth is renewed. Yeah. Um, where it the kingdom does expand through people being right. the hands and feet of Jesus. And so thinking of, thinking of just the earth versus heaven, if your, your idea of heaven is the, the renewed, renewed heavens and earth, because the Bible doesn't talk a lot about heaven, the other place that we go. It talks about like a final destination of, yeah, renewed heavens and earth. It's here. It's not a different earth. It's just renewed. And so, if there is a progression, there is the charitable in, in interpretation would be like focused on like the here and now, but with an aim towards like how can I be the renewed heaven and earth now and be a part of that renewal? Yeah, I would be totally for that. I'm not sure that was that's what Francis Chan means, and that's why I I, I don't really agree with it. But I. If that's what, if it was closer to that, because it does feel like a little bit of a dig towards Christians who are a little bit more progressive often. Will, I know. We already talked about that though. Will, we talked about the digs on it. I'm trying to steel man it a little bit. Right. But, <laughs> but I mean, like, I feel like the dig is, I'm, I'm, I might be saying something a little bit different. Oh, okay. Um, I'll allow when, it. when Christians, <laughs> thank you. As the I, sh- know, I just can't I, tell if we're doing another lap on it or not. Oh, well, that, j- that's just all. just a, a lot of times when you become a more progressive Christian and you lose some of the like go invite Jesus over in your heart so you don't go to hell when you die, yeah, or so you get to go to heaven and be with Him because He loves you. Um, sometimes you focus more on like, oh crap, there's so much work to be done here that I've been missing because I've been focused on the future heaven, and so it does feel like a little bit of a dig towards like a lot of yeah. times, like you, you will at liberal Christians generally will be focused on like, how can we fix ju- injustices here and now? Because that's what bringing God's king- kingdom to earth is. Um, and so if he's pushing back against that, like, I don't like that either, but I don't know if that helped anything, but it was on my mind. So I said it. Uh, you going to summarize this, Andy? I'll just say the that charitable it, was, it was when I, uh, I think I used to be a dispensationalist. I think I was kind of raised that way that I thought that there was like the, there'll be that day and then I will float up into some place that's in the sky. But that day is like imminent, like anytime it could happen anytime. Who knows? But, but, uh, heaven is a place that I'm going to. Right. And um, it was actually the Bible Project. Hmm. Uh, maybe ten years ago, I saw that they had a video. Those dirty liberals that described <laughs> uh, <laughs> that described uh, what 
what the Bible actually says about the, the renewal of, of earth and that that is the description of the afterlife that we actually in, um, in, encounter. I remember having this like relief because mm. it just never sat w- right with me. Even as a kid, I remember thinking, I know that there's problems in the world, but like it's also a really cool place and it's beautiful. And like the people that I love are here and it's, it's awesome. And, and I, my life was not free from tragedy at all. I'm not trying to say that I like, I grew up in a perfect world and that's why I like had this view, Mm -hmm. but it was just hard for me mentally to like convince myself. Yes. And, and I'll be happier when I fly into the clouds and then, and then, yeah, again, like 10 years ago, coming to terms with this, like, wait a minute, no, no, it's the renewal. It's, it's the best version it's yeah. the in, it's God's original intended version of how Earth is supposed to be, um, and when, and getting to engage in that, like getting to engage in nature, getting to continue to engage in my friendships and relationships and and those things that matter. Yeah, and dogs. What if Jesus is inviting us into that now? You're right. The other piece was that it wasn't like a it wasn't a a, a switch that got flipped, right? Is that it? And that's Jesus, like. My kingdom is coming to earth. Uh, the wizard nodded. He allows it. <laughs> Lukewarm Christians. I hope you don't hate that because we're never stopping. <laughs> we're never going to not. I'm never coming to back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lukewarm Christians <laughs> love their luxuries and rarely give to the poor in a truly sacrificial way. 10%. The sacrificial is well. Is it enough? Let's go. Well, let's work backwards. What is <laughs> what is a truly sacrificial way mean? Uh, it means I th- I think Creflo Dollar is going to know better to, what to do with my money than I am, so I should give it to him. Who? Who? Creflo Dollar. Who's that? It's in his. <gasps> you guys don't know. I don't know. Oh, I wish I had a clip pulled. He is a legendary uh, prosperity guy. Oh, but pick pick one. Oh. Literally pick one. I, I, you can find. I don't think that's the point. No, it's not. It's like giving sec. It's giving to the poor, not I to kn- Creflo Dollar. I know he sounds like a shitty rapper. I just, I just <laughs> I, wanted to see his name. Yeah. I'm like, oh, it's a new guy. Oh yeah, he okay. just did an album with ASAP Rocky, right? I think those guys are pretty good. They sing about rap songs. Well, you just said <laughs> shitty, so you're lukewarm. <laughs> I also said they sing about rap songs. <laughs> <laughs> But in that voice, it works. Culturally I just, lukewarm. I know about them. They sing a little bit about rap songs. Okay. Uh, no. Christians love their luxuries. Okay. And rarely give to the poor in a truly sacrificial way. Maybe. What does it mean to be sacrificial? Does it mean to sell out all you have? Does it mean to just be generous in the context? Sacrificial it, means it, it costs you something. I feel like it, has it hurts. To, it hurts a little bit. You're not like, eh, it doesn't matter. Here. If it doesn't matter to you, then it's not a sacrifice. What's the next Dis- one? Disagree with that if you don't. Uh, yeah. I, What's the next I, one? This one doesn't... It, it. It's not firing me up in any way necessarily. And most it's people would like, probably, probably That's agree. what someone who loves their luxuries would say. Yeah. Next one. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh number seven. Gosh. We've only got three more to go. Lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. David Platt says, if you're not in a place where you feel desperate for the spirit of God, then there's no way you're on the front lines of the mission. When we're on the front lines, we feel desperately our need for God's help. Okay. What does David Platt do again? Uh, he Pastor. is. He gets quoted by... Francis Chan, professional quoted person. I'm not sure what he does, but if only we had a device. Keep going. Let me. Plant, I know the name. Let me plant some color to this and get you get your reaction. Okay. Um. I think this is most often uh, portrayed you- by the person who's who is living life as if it's pretty good. Life is pretty good. And because it's pretty good, I don't really need much. 
I may not have the luxury yacht. It's not crazy. God. But I've not lost any limbs, and I'm not struggling with cancer. And so life is pretty good. Is she being treated better than you deserve? I, I, I don't know if I would even, if it would even cross my mind. Okay. Right? It would just be like, in general, I think life is pretty good. I, I don't feel like I'm needing very much. And if I don't feel like I need very much, then I don't feel like I need God very much. I feel like a lot of these are control mechanisms to keep people in and to identify with what's out and, you know, to, to get people to engage with their local organization. And these statements? What's, what's wrong a lot, with that? Some of these statements, yeah, it's... It's a bad... It can be. It's well, not anything bad. Anything can be bad. David Platt. Donuts can be bad. American Baptist. Bananas can be bad. Senior pastor. He was senior pastor at the church at Bro- Brook Hills in Birmingham, Alabama from 2006 to 2014. At the time, he was the youngest. Do the math. So he's 45 now. He's my age. But he was the... That pastor from 2006. How old was he when he became pastor then? Seven years old. (laughs) The youngest megachurch pastor in the United States. Okay. His most recent tweet, wait, wail for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty. It will come, Isaiah 13, 6. God, help us lead others today to be saved from your coming judgment through faith in Jesus. Four hours ago, that's a real world tweet or X, or post, or whatever from David Platt, which makes me recoil a little bit. I'm not saying he's wrong in this statement, but there's David Platt. The language, I I think using language like front lines of the mission feels a little heavy-handed, but I do like the concept of uh, if you don't feel like there's any desperation for God, that means, that may imply that you don't feel like you need God, which may imply that you're, God, you should hit the microphone more if you could hit it more. I might. Andy, I might. I send, <laughs> I send in my heart because of what you've been doing. <laughs> I just send out loud on the podcast. Like, that is sin. That is sin. Oh, we need my. to upgrade our uh, thingies. What are these? Uh, our co-hosts. <laughs> we need to upgrade uh, our co-hosts. Yeah, that's what I meant. You yeah. didn't let me finish. I was going to get there. Um, I don't think any upgrade could save you from what you've been doing to that thing. No, but I'm feeling comfortable. I'm next to That's Colin. Good. We're on the <laughs> apostate couch. I love it. <laughs> uh, there, There is something to a statement of, God, I need you. And so if, you, if, if you're not in a place of saying, God, I need you, then what does that mean? What, what is God to you? Who is God to you? I struggle with this. Yeah, struggle with it, man. Talk about it. It it, it feels exhausting. But it, you, it feels religious. The God I need you statement Not can way. be said anywhere and still have that same um I, yeah, I just we can imagine contexts and moments where someone's saying, Oh God, I need you as not really being a good moment. Um I don't need to give an example here. So, How, are you talking about Jeff's secret sin? Don't worry about the don't, don't worry about the is. words as much, but someone who in their life doesn't act like they have that like they need God, but would say out loud they're a Christian. They're a Christian. Is that is that in conflict? It's, it would I mean, it would seem as such on one level because, well, that presumes a couple things in that statement. Well, what's what's hard for you to just say yes to that? Because in my mind, this is a pretty easy one. Oh, well, then you say why. Why is this easy for you? Well, what was the thing that I said? <laughs> well, read... No. We read part of it. Number seven. If I say I'm a Christian and I don't need God, what am I? If you're in a place where you're not desperate. It, if I, I'm just going to, 
it's manipulative language. The, the word is, is manip- so that's why I'm just trying to say like um, I'm, I'm going to say that if I'm if I'm not in a place where I would say that I need God, then that then the underlying implication of that is um, I don't I don't actually believe. In God, maybe there is there is no faith there. Well, maybe I think you could also be in a place in your life where, in the moment, you're not needing in the sense of I need rescuing right now, but you can still recall all the past times you have been rescued. I don't see how, in the moment of the present, if you're in, if you're satisfied. Well, needing God could take lots of shapes, right? Sure. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I need God to rescue me in the moment. That's one version of it. And at some point in, in my life, I felt that. At okay. times in my life, I felt that. There's also times in my life where I felt like, God, I need, I need some uh, extra patience here because I want to get out of my car and let that person know what they've done <laughs> and how wrong they are. Mm-hmm. And and so I think. The need for God is three dimensional. I think it shows up in lots of different ways. It doesn't just have to be, um, do I need you for my salvation? It should mean that, but it can mean a lot of other things too. But eventually, if I if I'm making statements or I'm acting like I don't need God, then am I still a Christian? What about the people that feel confident that they don't need God. They don't need to feel desperate for God in the sense that they are reasonably confident. Like they've achieved God, perfection. No, but God is there. You belong. You're eminently accepted, and you're resting in that. And and w- amongst all of the noise, I'm describing myself at my best right now. Because I I waver in and out of this, but just just knowing like there isn't a a checklist of like oh crap I sinned make sure I ask for forgiveness specifically for that because I don't I don't need that not that I don't sin and I don't need forgiveness but I already I, the forgiveness is there and I I rest in that yeah and so it's just a base of operations for me is again at my best is like it's already there there's no worrying about like. Oh no, I'm I'm outside of the box. It's like no, I made a mistake. Move on. Like that happened. What if Move you on. didn't? What if you didn't uh, connect need with worry? Like, do you need the most important relationships in your life? Your relationship with Lisa, your wife. Your relationship with your kids. Your relationship with your best friends on this podcast right now. <laughs> No, need is the wrong. If if we're being Nazis on definitions, no, I don't need that. I don't want to I be want a Nazi. That. I want that, and I crave that, and I have that, and so maybe that's kind of like God. I I have God, and so the language I, that they're using is very much like, you better make sure you're you're doing the right thing. Can, like that's what it kind of implies. Can you read it again? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I know. I'm, I, and I purposely cut out all the words about desperate because it's the desperately need piece that feels like that qualifier makes it a harder mm-hmm. pill to swallow, I think. I'll well, read but, and that's I, I why, read it. That's why I'm like bugged by this. I know. I was trying to make it softer. I was trying to convince you to just agree with me. But I'm going to tell, I'll text Lisa later and tell you don't need her. Okay, <laughs> Christians do oh, not- she listens. <laughs> yeah, Christians do not live by faith. By the way, actually, before I go on, I, I do need those relationships. I, yeah. I would again. You're a better person than me. <laughs> I I actually need them to to be the person that I am. Like yeah, it, it, it's that important to me. But I'm glad you don't care about a friendship. Lukewarm Christians. <laughs> I believe I clarified. I said I desperately want them. I don't think Zach is Zach without us. I know this it's is true. The way you are, you're so welcome. Yeah, it includes my wife and kids, and I I. <laughs> If anybody interpreted that differently, you're wrong, (laughs) and I'm going to banish you to hell. Lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. It's probably a good, important one to call out. So if I'm not living by faith, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe all things are ordered, and I'm in control. Okay. Uh, Their lives are structured, so they never have to. I set up systems. I set up things so that I don't 
have to right. rely on anyone other than myself. Uh, David Platt says, if you're not in a place where you feel desperate for the spirit of God, then there's no way you're on the front lines of the mission. When we're on the front lines, we feel desperately our need for God's help. Hmm. I think this is the rich young ruler. I think that's who it's pointing Maybe. out. And I promise you, David Platt doesn't think about his oh, whatever. Life. Don't get hung up on him. Don't worry about him. But they're yeah. they're they're imposing know, this on us. No, it's just yeah. yeah. Look at the argument on its own. Allow it to prima facie. I've spoken en- enough about this. I'm I don't ready speak to move Latin on. per se. Yeah, I, <laughs> per se, <laughs> I'm sure there's a Latin translation for per se. But I, the need, the desperate that dependence okay i also would prefer to switch those and a person who's wanting to revere and honor god like if that isn't a priority for you yeah dependence aside regardless of the situation you're in i think that's more telling in a lot of ways cuz you can like the dependence on on the spirit yeah that's great yeah. Nothing against that. But, um, and I think that, again, honoring and, and reverence pushes yeah. it in a different direction. I think that's probably a bit more outward than desperate dependence is generally the evangelical problem of the individual rather than the communal. Hmm. And that allows just the individual to remain desperate and dependent upon Jesus without looking at what's the community need sure, and who does the community need me to be for it right now. That's really good. And that's, that's a massive problem. So reverence and honor, you can't read the old Testament and think individual. It's impossible. Yeah. (laughs) Even most of the new Testament even most of the New Testament, yes. Like Jesus is like. W- There's too many one, y'alls instead of, you know, the yous. Yeah. yeah. That are most often just translated. J- Jesus forgives you. households on behalf yeah. of one person's yeah. faith. Right. It's like there, everything was connected in a way. And we, we impart our individualism back into a lot of those texts. Desperation feels exhausting. Yeah. That's, it just feels. <laughs> it, it is. Right. It's Cause cause it is. It's, it's the <laughs> wrong kind of religious language. And it's like desperation is like. Oh, I don't feel desperate right now. I'm doing something wrong as a Christian. Like, let me get the checklist out. Hmm. And I, I doubt these individuals are trying to put that on people. But if they weren't, maybe they could choose better language. But let's let's okay. let's get through these and okay, land this we're plane. Almost, we're almost done. Number eight. Uh, lukewarm Christians give God their leftovers, not their first and best. Stop calling your complacency and apathy a busy schedule or bills or forgetfulness. Ooh. Call it what it is. Evil. Malachi 1.8. That's so stupid. We know Zach's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> what does Malachi Zach 1.8 say? Zach is a say? yes for number eight lukewarm <laughs> Christian. <laughs> and I think number seven, six, five, four, and three also yeses. Whatever you do in word and deed, do all for the glory of God. Like the, the way that's worded is like, oh shoot, again, it's another checklist. Like, Oh, because I'm busy with my work to provide for my family, therefore, I'm not actually on the front lines fighting for Jesus. Is that the spirit of what's meant by that verse? It's That's not, what it sounds like? It's and not maybe, really whatever you do. Well, you're, oh, the verse I'm talking about? Yeah. That's, uh, how, maybe, uh, why don't you, why are you saying that? <laughs> why, why, why did you quote that verse? Because whatever you're doing in life, you can when you're doing something well, so I, th- maybe this is my interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and you guys come at me with, come at me if you have a different uh, take. It's like, you have to, you're working because you need to pay the bills. Yeah. You can do that to the best of your ability. Yeah. With honor and integrity. And I think that glorifies God according to their language. I don't, I don't go around life sure. thinking in those terms, but it's just like, do things without compromise. Being a good father, yeah. raising your kids well, yeah. the busyness of life. Everybody's busy in America. You can do those things and be glorifying God. The way they are wording it is like there's some like hierarchy that we're missing because like, oh, no, I'm busy today. Sorry, I can't help you move. I'm busy today. 
Sorry, I forgot to come by the hospital. I, I'm. You're being charitable. I'm on, I'm on this, this, You're being this charitable. chair. I'm on what the Christian, the, what, what was Christian the ver- couch. What was the verse they uh, quoted? Malachi 1.8. Malachi. It's my favorite Italian. Malachi. Movie. It's a Malachi. <laughs> I want to eat. I want to eat the pasta. Uh, you get, did you get it pulled up? Com- compla- it, it is an argument against compla- complacency and apathy. What you described um, is not being a complacent or apathetic person working hard for your family, trying to do well. That's not complacency and apathy. Uh, I think this is a flavor of one of the earlier points, which is basically like, hey, that's pretty cool. Someone else will do it, right? Someone else is doing the good work, and I felt pumped up about it. Hmm. Would you like me to read the verse? One yeah, eight. Definitely. Malachi one eight. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, said the Lord Almighty? So basically, are you offering shitty sacrifices to the Lord? (laughs) Then GTFO. Are you? All the time. (laughs) Well. And that's why I'm triggered. Uh, (laughs) GTFO. (laughs) And that's why you will find me in Laodicea. <laughs> wow. Sucking on some dirty old pond water. Dirty pond water. At this point, this beer is lukewarm, which is better than hot beer. Boiling beer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely better. So it's definitely... Yeah, don't don't offer bad sacrifices, but really, like, how do you apply that verse as a one-to-one to our current context? Well, why did he read the thing again? And Lukewarm he just, Christians uh-huh. give God their leftovers. Okay. Not their first and best. Okay. Stop calling your complacency and apathy a busy schedule or bills or forgetfulness. Call it what it is, evil. This goat is looking at me cross-eyed, and this goat has beautiful eyes. I'm going to give that one to God. I'm going to sacrifice the one that's cross-eyed and blind. Give that one to God so I can keep the goat that makes good eye contact with me. Everybody knows that. That just goes without saying. <laughs> but I mean, when it says, would you sacrifice a blind? So it is like, would it's you? A, it's a shitty sacrifice is what they're implying. Yeah. Right. They're saying like, you you found something. You're like, I can make and more money with this goat. I think so I'm going to hang on to this one. I'll just give you the crappy one. I think what's kind of juicy is later on in Malachi, God says he's going to take the shit of their sacrifices God, and put it on them. Here. And put it on them. On them. Spread it over them. Because they're that bad. So God doesn't want that. Nope. Doesn't want it. It's that bad. I'm going to take them and just smear it, rub it around. Oh, like physically. Well. Smoosh it the on The imagery them. is pretty. <laughs> it's pretty clear. I'm glad yeah. you said that. It's really yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah. So track. translate this to us. We don't have goats. Do we? I don't but, have any goats. But the my way wife that, would love to have some goats, by the way. The way... If she, I could, if she I could thinks get many goats and many pigs exist. She thinks those are real things. They're just babies that they they're kill. They're just bo- babies. They, they kill get, them before they... They sacrifice them to God before they grow up. They get big. I kept trying to tell her, she's like, let's get a mini pig. I'm like, no, no, that's not a mini pig. <laughs> it's just a baby. It will be 400 plus pounds. I'm with her in that they are adorable. And a baby goat crawling on you is the best thing ever. Yeah. But they grow up, and then they set, they they worship the devil. That's what goats do. <laughs> when when the pig gets too big, do you eat it? That oh. could be the deal with you and Lindsay. Just like it's, we're cool having it, but when it gets to X amount of pounds, we're taking it to the butcher. We're having the luau. It's going to be great, and then we can start over again. So don't name the pig babe or anything like that. Just we can work this plan. It's a compromise. I'm going to make sure Lindsay doesn't listen to this podcast because <laughs> there's no way in hell that's happening. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Those are uh, their poop machines. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, this is the type of language. I'm not putting this on Francis, um, but it's the kind of language that church organizations use to control people. If I'm not a generous person, if I don't give of my time, if I don't do things for others, usually it's if giving, I don't give giving of, to the church. If, if I don't give of my time, do you pick the most charitable definition of this. If I just take I care, of, if I just take care of me, 
Mm -hmm. and I give all these excuses. Does that am I an, am I the hot slash super cool wonderful Christian, or am I in lukewarm territory? I, yeah, I I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the difficulty of this there's there's a bit of truth in it. Sure. In because as I'm hearing you say it probably for the fifth time, because I don't have the sheet of paper in front of me. Sorry. No, that's okay. And and someone is so self-involved and so, again, it assumes that their busyness isn't doing good things. Because you can be really busy doing meaningful things. We, we know people in our lives yeah. that, that are doing that and that are meaningful for other people and that could fit the definition of sacrifice. I don't uh, think that's what they're arguing against. I don't think that is yeah. either. So it's, again, that busyness that is more, you know, self-absorbed, navel-gazing. Yeah. Just, I want to I want to binge Netflix type of busyness. Sure. I'm busy. I'm, I'm shampooing my hair. But that, and I think the, the trap of it is more along the lines of that person is missing out on what emerges when they engage in a meaningful way in community. Yeah. Where they allow themselves to be known and they give sacrificially of, let's say, it's a skill they have or... Their time, their treasure, and their talent? Yeah, right. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I thought I put it into airplane mode. <laughs> that is so good. That's your phone, Andy, right? You're getting a call from Loverboy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you, Malachi is not a long book. This isn't the uh, smear you on it that you mentioned, Colin, but, but God, according to Malachi, goes on to say, so I will come to put you on trial. I will be, qu be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers. So far, most Christians are like, yeah. Not me. Put them on trial. Get those guys and I, girls. But then he goes on in the same group against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless deprive the foreigners among you of justice, but do not fear me. Just, uh, you know, food for thought. <laughs> Anyways, we got one more. Okay, one I, more. Here we go. Let me borrow this. By the way, uh, I don't think that either one of you checked that box of uh, not giving. The beauty of this list is that I think hopefully everyone is listening and being like, oh yeah, I technically, it's worth thinking about. Like, yes, I, I'm not. At times, I, don't I may be. Oh. And, and you vacillate in and out. I found it. Do you want me to read yeah, it? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. What'd you find? And now, you priests, this oh, turn that mic a little bit more towards you. This like bend morning, it, bend it down a little bit. There, yeah. So I'm the new guy. Sorry. And now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. That's rad. On your face. So God uh, God sees the crap that you just gave him, and he's going to smear it in your face. To the priests. To the priests, uh, no less. To the priests. And that's often the way this goes, is the, peop the insiders... The, re the religious elite, the people that belong, are the ones that receive the hardest rebukes. The face smearing. Even in the New Testament, it's always the, the t tables were turned not at the people who were sinners. It was the people who thought they weren't. Anyways, keep going. I think the most damning version of number eight, which I just read, mm -hmm. is... Uh, the person who comes to church and functions with the idea that someone else will take care of this, that I'm not needed to contribute to what this community needs to function. Yeah. Someone else will do this. That's, that's how I read that one. And I go, dude, you're missing the point. Okay. Number nine, the last one. We made it guys. Wow. We're here. Deep breaths. We can do this. We all struggle with seasons where we're lukewarm. Seasons. Like you just said. It's your favorite word, Zach. Seasons. Where, we're, where we are striving to maintain a commitment to Christ, but where we falter. I've been there too. Oh, well, that's nice. Is He's that how he ends just it? Just like one of us? Yeah. Also, maybe I numbered it inappropriately when I 
send it over. But the fundamental question is this. When you became a Christian, did it include a surrender to get engaged in the mission of God? Have you personally engaged in the mission of God, offering your time, talent, treasures as a blank check to him? If not, you're not his follower. I don't know if that last part is J.D. Greer or Francis Chan. No, I, I think, think it's, it's Chan. That last one? I think Greer was just quoted once, and that was four things ago or three things ago. Regardless, whoever it was. Irregardless. Well. Not a word. Every time I become a Christian, I feel like I'm getting closer. <laughs> it's mostly a joke, but I've, I did, you know, it goes back to when I was a teenager, and I did invite Jesus into my heart a lot. <laughs> Usually late at night <laughs> in my room alone. One more time. Sorry, God. <laughs> uh, I like I like the the definition being described as like you are you are for the mission of God. Yeah, I can I I can get on board with that language. What what I would con- uh, caution against is reading something like this or being a part of a community where they do these things and feeling like you're either in or you're out and that's always the way it will be. Because as we go through these, if you're, if you're honest with yourself, maybe I'm projecting for myself, according to this and according to my own definitions of what it means to follow Christ, I'm lukewarm. And sometimes I'm not. And sometimes yeah, I am and sometimes I'm cold. You know, I vacillate, but I'm oriented towards loving like Jesus loved. Like, and I feel like I'm, I've never been more that way now than, than ever before. And even though I've shed a lot of the, like, you got to check this doctrinal box and you, you got to have the proper view of the Trinity and you have to, you have to declare this with confidence. Like a lot of the, the creeds are like, we believe this, 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 and this. And a lot of those I'm sympathetic with, but a lot of them, or some of them, I might be like, well, what does it actually mean? Nevertheless, in my past, I would have been like, no questions asked, 100%. Yeah. But I definitely wasn't oriented towards Christ in the way that I am now. Yeah. As a, as a lot of people might say, a liberal Christian theologically, but I, you know, we can talk about that label some other time. Colin? So don't put yourself in a box. You can <laughs> sometimes you go in, sometimes you go out. Just just change your direction. Repent is just a re- redirect. I'm not against being challenged to be better than you are right now, and I think that that's I agree with you on par with what Jesus does with everyone that he encounters. He meets them exactly where they're at, and recognizes, offers grace and mercy in that moment, and then it's like, okay, now when you leave. Do better. Do better than this, than you were before. Like, be different. Mm-hmm. And so, if I read this, again, in the most charitable light, and I see areas where I'm like, could I be, I, if I just ask myself the question, in, in any one of these things, if I, if I go to the spirit of what it's trying to say, does it challenge me, do I have room to be better? And... And do I think that God is calling me to be better in in one of those areas? I should I should be willing to engage him and ask him, like, all right, Holy Spirit, like, show me, show me these areas, sh- show me the opportunities that I need, like, convince me. Con- I don't know, God, convict feels like a weird word. It's the one I wanted, like, started to say, but I don't really want to say convict. But there's a time for that. Uh, maybe the word in- inspired be inspired by the Holy Spirit feels a little more accurate with what I want to go with. So I'm okay with saying um, lot these there's the core of many of these things are good to are worth striving for. And because they're hard to do or because they may be sacrificial doesn't necessarily mean that they shouldn't be um, pursued in the most positive way in in the way that G- we we see Jesus pursuing these things in the Bible and that he calls us to pursue. Yeah. I could get behind all of your charitable caveats. 
Oh, but you have a little critique. Go ahead, go ahead and give no. a little pushback as we uh, no, as we I, close this out. I, I would say you you have my book. That is, I think there's a woof. Is it ever a book? It's a book. Why don't you uh, give it a little plug right now? It's worth it. It's Suspicion and Faith by Merrill Westfall, and he's treating or examining atheists yeah. and their criticisms of Christian practice. Is it? And it's Freud, Nietzsche, and there's a third one. Marx. Oh, that little guy. That little guy, and I think. It's, yes, it's provocative. Yeah. Will it get you to reflect? Absolutely. Is it hard to get a paperback edition? Yes. But it, I think this is fine. It stays on the inside. If you want to push yourself and become a bit more conversant with Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx and still have this same kind of fruitful practice, read the book. And... Because it, it's it's allowing them to critique. Yeah, it's it's basically to, to critique your faith, basically. Yeah, and I I don't think it's you're at risk of losing your faith by reading the text in any way, in any means. But uh, I just think it does it better if you have the time, or if you're really interested in using some sort of yeah a spiritual some spiritual checkpoints as a as a discipline. Hey, I'm gonna post these questions up and once a month I'm going to sit and reflect. Yeah. With these charitable caveats of how these are written. Sure. Great. Do it. But I, I'd recommend that book as a far superior if you have the time. What's because the name one? What's the name of the book? Suspicion and Faith Pardon? by Merrill Westfall. And because I think it's going to make you more conversant if you, if you do have that predisposition to, hey, I'm sitting next to someone on a plane and I want to have a productive conversation and I am genuinely interested in them first, not attempting to mm -hmm. just They're not convert. an object to like switch. Yeah. 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 And I, I think it'll just prepare you as a, as a speaker to be a bit more understanding mm. of what maybe outsiders yeah. that perhaps in Nietzsche really wanted to be an insider, but his own intellectual sort of holdings and convictions didn't allow him to. But that's another conversation. Tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know where we're landing. This is so, that's so good. I think, I think most Christians, especially in apologetics, you kind of get the cartoonish version of Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud. But this book is like, it fleshes them out in a way and their critiques of Christianity and, and or belief in general. It, it really is going to put, if it's going to forge your faith through fire, you're going to be better for it. If you take seriously, if this isn't just some like cartoon, like most people, it's like they, be, yeah. it's a, it's the straw man version of Nietzsche and Marx that we get to beat up on and feel superior and like, Oh yeah, mm -hmm. obviously intellectually Jesus is the answer and it's easy. It's like, no, there's really good critiques and you yeah. can you can uh, refine your faith through that book, which you tell me when you want it back. I have it. I'm not <laughs> done with it because I bounced around with my books, but it is one where I'm like, I'll read a page and a half and be like, yeah, I need to go back. <laughs> I need to go back. That's a good oh, one. man. I do that with C.S. Lewis too. Like, that's really good. Wait, what did I just read? Hold on just a <laughs> second. I got go. to read that again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's land this plane. Uh, listeners and YouTube uh, friends, thank you for sticking through. We are Bros Bibles and Beer. You can uh, follow us on all the socials at Bros Bibles Beer. Uh, you can email us, Bros Bibles Beer at gmail.com. You can leave comments for us on YouTube. We love those. We read the top comments and uh, like just like we did uh, today. And uh, if you want to, you can leave us a voicemail. Now, Zach, do you have have you checked? Has anyone left us a voicemail? We don't have any new voicemails. We don't have any new voicemails. But also, if, I didn't check today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <my>, Speakpipe.com <laughs> slash bros. Speakpipe.com slash bros. You can leave us a voicemail. Yep. And you can do that from your uh, mobile device. Wherever. For Zach, Colin, I am Andy. We are Bros Bibles and Beer. Grace. Peace. Cheers. Cheers.
Oh wait, Jeff. Jeff has something to say. Blasp of me of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Good Miss insight. you, Jeff. Miss you, buddy. <laughs> 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 I just hit myself so hard in the head with those headphones. <laughs>